Hello everybody, welcome to See the People. My name is Ragini and uh, we are back with yet another edition of Small Screen Fest. Today we have three very wonderful authors for an engaging conversation on a subject that has been the talk of town for some quite some time now. Let us quickly jump on today's session, but before that I would like to introduce uh, all to our, our panelists. Uh, Yasmin Seat is a counselor, purpose coach, and an author. Her book, Manan, uh, encourages readers to delve within deeper and empowers women to find a purpose. Meghna Pant is an award-winning, best-selling author of eight fiction and non-fiction books, including the recent bestseller, Boys Don't Cry. And finally, we have Seema Anand. Yeah, here, here's the book. <laughs> And finally, we have Seema Anand, who is a storyteller, a mythologist specializing in women's narratives and an award-winning author, a corporate guru, and now a popular digital content creator. So welcome, everybody. And uh, it is so wonderful to have all of you for our session today. So, uh, you know, I would like to start by recalling um, actor Michelle Yao's Oscar winning speech, which she recently delivered. Uh, she said, ladies, don't let anybody tell you you are past your prime and never give up. So uh, and it was a very powerful statement for we have for we as women have always been designated a timeline, a timeline for our marriage, for motherhood, for career and so on. So I would like to know from each one of you, how can we beat this thing, beat this narrative of prime age for women? We, we can start with Yasmin. Thank you so much. And um, I don't think there is a prime age at all because uh, recently I read that Barbara um, Higgins had delivered a baby through uh, IVF okay. because she lost her daughter uh, and uh, at the age of 50, uh, 57, she delivered a child. So I said prime age, even for a reproductive thing where uh, at one point they would say that, you know, between, the, between uh, 20 and 25 women used to have uh, children and post that, you know, post 30, they say it's difficult. But uh, Barbara Higgins had a baby uh, through uh, IVF at 57. Mm -hmm. And she has been encouraging other women also to have babies that way. So I don't know where the prime age ends or begins. Okay. Uh, uh, Meghna? Yeah. So I said, in, uh, I think for our field in particular, uh, the older you get, it's actually a blessing because uh, I think your work, your output actually increases. The stories you are able to tell, thanks to your numerous vast experiences, actually becomes uh, much richer. Uh, there's much more depth. There's much more empathy as you get older and therefore hopefully wiser. So I think, in fact, for our field, um, it's it's a blessing, really. And I think age is just a number. I'll tell you, give you the example of my nani ji, for example. Uh, you know, she was never sent to school um, because of patriarchy and uh, she she didn't even, uh, I think, know what the word feminism, for example, even meant. But she was the biggest feminist I knew. She became widowed at the age of 35 and she had five children in Shimla who she had to fend for. Uh, she didn't have money, obviously. She uh, had no income and her brother-in-law would give her, I think, 400 rupees uh, a month. And with that money, she used that to send her four daughters to the best uh, schools in Shimla and everybody told her but uh, kyon pe paise kyu kharch kar rahe education pe paise kyu kharch kar rahe and she said no I will give my daughters the best education possible because this is remember back in the 1950s and 60s and uh, lo and behold she sent my mother also to one of the best schools in Shimla and my mother then went to Chandigarh University she graduated as a gold medalist uh, uh, from there and went on to retire then ultimately as the chief commissioner of income tax from uh, Mumbai where I currently live mm -hmm. And my nani ji at the age of, I think, 70, uh, finally decided that she's going to start, you know, learning the alphabet at least. Uh, and she's, her grandchildren all, we, we used to adore her. We all doted on her. We all gathered together to, you know, uh, teach her what she had a lifelong passion for, but couldn't do during 
uh, those 70 years because of familial, you know, sort of pressures. So I think if somebody like my nani ji uh, can learn the word feminism at the age of 70, 75 uh, and be proud of it, then age is definitely a number and no age is too young or too old to go and follow your dreams, to come to terms with what your dreams actually are. Uh, even for me, I realized I want to become an author only by my late 20s and that's when I really poured mm -hmm. myself into the field. Uh, and when I look at people writing books at 16 and 15, I, I keep wishing I'd started earlier and I had that kind of focus. But I think everyone's life's journey, you're meant to be exactly where you end up. So embrace it, enjoy it. Whatever your dreams is, however little or big you think they are, let not something like age, which is a social construct, um, you know, it's just mm -hmm. all in our head, uh, hold you back from what or who you should truly be, whatever that dream is. Yeah, that's so wonderful. And it's so inspiring to hear uh, stories of people just, just you know, uh, beating this thing that age is a social construct and we want yeah. to retaliate that again and again that's so yeah. nice uh, uh seema what what is your take on this we were previously discussing uh, about how seema goes on and says things which are often hushed upon but yeah she goes on and deliver them so what do you think so, um, Ragni, I think I realized uh, I resonate a lot with both um, what Yasmin and uh, Meghna have just said. But I think I've realized that age is not a number in the woman's head, whatever the woman is going through me, for instance. I don't think I realize what my age is when I'm doing my work or doing whatever I need to do. It's society around me that is more mm -hmm. focused on my, what my age is and what I should be doing according to their permission of what is permitted to a woman of my age. Um, going back to what <clears throat> Meghna was saying, I come from a similar kind of very, very fortunate background of very powerful, very strong women who've done incredible things. So my great grandmother was educated and a working woman. And she was also, I mean, aside from having a pretty senior job with the government, she was also a social um, uh, activist. So she used to work with violence against women. And she actually died leading a protest against this. But they had, and I think I have to give equal credit to my great grandfather because it was together between them. They had four daughters, my nanny being one of them. Um, and they decided to educate them fully. So two turned out to be doctors, my nanny and her younger sister. And the older two became uh, colleges, uh, sorry, principals of colleges, the GCWs. One in Simla, funnily enough, Meghna, and um, one in Chandigarh. And so between all of, you know, then my mother who got divorced when she was pregnant with me, had the support of her parents, brought me up by myself, by herself, etc. So, you know, you come to a point where you arrive in this world knowing that women have the right to be whatever they want to be, whoever they want to be, and at any stage or age that they want to be. And then you step out into society and you're suddenly told, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think as far as I'm concerned, my biggest amount of um, trolling that I get is people saying, Abhi to auntie ji, aap kya kar rahe ho? Uh, you know, and I find that actually, Dadi ma, zara dekke, and so on. I find that actually really abusive, far worse than the abuse that is used, because I think it is so patronizing and it annoys me. But I get told constantly, Ki, ab to aapka puja paat ka time aa gaya. Ab aap ke puja paat karo. And I always want to say to these people, Ki, puja paat to maine pehle bhi kar liya. Mere, you know, like I haven't necessarily left this time of my life to just do that. I can do other things too. So yeah, let's, um, I mean, it would be lovely to say, let's break the myth around uh, what is the prime age, yeah. but we have all been fed this narrative very deeply. Mm, yeah, we are conditioned that way. We have grown up that way, hearing such things. Uh, moving on, I I see that all all three of you have such distinct voices when it comes to storytelling. But the one common factor that ties all of you together is, uh, you know, is stories, is telling stories, telling stories of people. Uh, you speak on things like we mentioned, you speak on things that is usually frowned upon, but they are so delicately laced with stories. 
with storytelling uh do you think it is the best way to reintroduce women's narratives narratives yeah absolutely you know stories are the most powerful tool of influence it's the only thing that actually will get through to somebody uh, telling somebody a piece of philosophy is fantastic it makes no sense to that person you know it, the idea comes from when ved vyas is sitting on top of a mountain feeling very sorry for himself and narad muni comes along and he says what's going on why are you feeling so upset and ved vyas says well you know the problem is i have written books i've written philosophies i've written texts on every single thing that a human being might ever need to know about and how to deal with it you know how to work their life around it but society just keeps falling into more disrepair and people are falling into depression i don't know what to do and now it says but well, you've just made it too complicated tell them stories it'd be so much easier convert the philosophy into stories tell it to them because that's something that sinks in and you'll notice chahe tum jitne marzi facts bata do kisi ko when you tell somebody a story that will actually stay in their head forever every effective leader through history has used stories to pass on their message and i think that it is literally the only way to do so so definitely i believe in the power of stories and i also believe that it's the stories that we hear around us you know that we are not taught everything that we know sometimes we're born into a set of stories some knowledge we automatically have in our heads and that comes from the stories that are told around us and we literally do grow up i had my cook the other day saying to me about how her husband was treating her really badly i mean he he was physically violent he was abusive and she kept saying ki you know main kisi ko bata bhi nahi sakti kyunki log kya kahenge and I suddenly realized that you know we have instilled this idea of the good woman so carefully with the stories that we tell. वो तो देवी समान है उसने कभी कुछ नहीं कहा अपने हस्बैंड के बारे देखो कितनी अच्छी है. You know what I mean? Like so, yeah. We just need to start telling different stories. We have to stop telling the victim story. We have to start telling different story. I think it's the most powerful thing that you can do because we live through those stories. Yeah. I am definitely. a proponent of um, stories and mm. strong stories yeah uh, meena i was just going through your tedx talk before this where you spoke about your marriage and and the stuff that you had to go through and then again re uh, restart your journey do you also believe that storytelling is one of the popular tools that can help uh, change women's narratives Hi, yeah. I'm so sorry. Apologies, I'm having a little bit of a bad connection today. Uh, sorry, what was your question again? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was going through your TEDx TEDx talk uh, before coming on before coming on to your panel, and I was listening to your story of uh, your previous marriage and everything, and then how you had to restart your journey and how that has been. Do you also believe that storytelling is one of the powerful tools that we can use to change women's narratives? Uh, absolutely. You know, I um, I don't know how many of you read my most recent novel, Boys Don't Cry. Uh, that was a real life account of an abusive marriage I went through thir- uh, 14 years ago now, and you know, despite the fact that I write very fast and furiously, and I've written several books. uh this was one novel that took me almost 8 years to gather the courage to write uh because it was i think the only work i've done that is so close to the heart that is you know picked from actual instances from my own life and it was very traumatic uh very triggering for me to even write a novel like this uh but i plowed through and i did it because i have two young daughters now they are you know uh the ages of 3 and 5 and i said i owe it to my girls to tell this narrative how painful it is because that's what we are right uh, if i speak of something that was considered say divorce was considered taboo 10 years ago when i actually mm. in 2013 uh, when i was going through it it was still considered a bit of a taboo not a taboo perhaps but still a stigma and because i came out in the open and and owned my very public failure which was what it was called at that time it inspired i feel many other women also to speak about their trauma and i've always believed that silence is the biggest violence So when I wrote about it for the first time in, an, uh, in a short article for Femina in 2015, I think uh, it was like the floodgates of hell opened up, and women from all over the country, 
messaged me on facebook that time facebook was very popular they emailed me and said that you know uh, thank you for for what you did because nobody talks about this uh, domestic violence is always sort of considered a you know sort of uh, behind something that occurs behind closed doors is considered something that society just distances itself from that it's a private problem of that women face that we don't have to get involved with or we cannot get involved with so bringing it out opening that pandora's box i think helped a lot of women, other women also gather the courage and also men by the way who are also victims who can be victims also of domestic abuse but are even further uh, their their traumas for the trivialize that they speak about it because you know uh, of these tropes like mard ko dard nahi hota and how can a woman hit a man and all of that so it, it helped even some men come out in the open and talk about what they went through so i think if we as storytellers uh, sort of become the vessel for whatever is considered taboo or is considered a stigma how would painful that journey is personally for us it creates a better society because if an individual like me can change the mind of a family a family can change the mind of a neighborhood a neighborhood can change the mind of society that's how our nation will change that's how our world will change and that's how we progress as a gender and as a humanity for sure yeah yeah and uh, i do believe that women need to speak their own stories because uh, we if we don't tell who will who else will fight for us however uh, you know they often lack the space to do so they are often overpowered by the men in their life they are cut off mid mid sentences or sometimes they are not even considered uh, important enough to be on the table for when it comes to decision making uh, uh yasmin i would like to you because i have i read your book manan and they are a collection of of stories from different sorts of from women of all walks of life who go out and just uh, who have restarted journey despite being the age of 60 uh, what do you think how women should create their own space and how can they rewrite their identities uh if you take my own self uh i have always been under the shadow of my father and then now it's my children so it was it has it had always been very difficult for me to you know do something what i wanted to do but then at some point we need to gather that courage and say that you know i need to live a life for myself recently i was traveling to pondicherry and i was there and i and i was just sitting there and looking at my life 40 years back i was young and naive when i went to pondicherry and i was sitting there and i realized it looked like a it looked like a history to me so what looks like a history to me 40 years later 40 years later it looked like a decade to somebody yes. else so i think we should not waste our time what happened happened we need to move on and we need to start life like for example when i look at people who are already so well established in doing a social work i feel bad sometimes if i had started somewhere along with doing whatever i was doing i would have been established but i feel like i'm starting off now but then i'm not ready to give up at least i've taken a step ahead one step at a time i will reach there whatever years i have but i will do that and yes of course people um people have their own ideologies they tell me oh why are you doing this you can just tell your children they will i don't need anybody to do it for me i will do it for myself when my children were small they were they were tiny they were weak they were holding my finger and i in fact it was the other way round i was holding their finger and i was holding the twig thinking it's a branch back then if i if i really had to get up back then that is what was my thought but the day i realized that no i can do it so i'm working towards it every day is a work in progress and i see for a better tomorrow yeah that's that's very hopeful that's very reassuring in a way uh seema i would like to know from you what what do you think how should women create 
their own spaces how should they barge in and how can they do it i think that there isn't unfortunately a formula for it i think that we make our spaces just by being it's a case of um, the resilience that we've been talking about between all of us just now um yasmin megna both mentioned it i'm going to say it again the word resilience i know i don't like to use the word resilience because it's used as part of the victim narrative also of the woman but it is also what makes sure that it pushes us forward i i'm you know, like I constantly get this. I, I always say that I'm married to a very typical Punjabi boy, Delhi Punjabi guy. He's now 71. So you can imagine from that particular age group. And he has very definite ideas. Now, he's also the same man who's helped me to be where I am, who supports me. But he has very specific ideas of what he would have liked. I, and poor man hasn't had it. I mean, he's got a wife like me. He would have loved to have a really good, um, you know, a nice companion who would sort of listen to his ideas and pay attention to what he was saying and he hasn't had that he's got me instead i have made my space by telling my story and letting my voice get a little bit louder with every time that i've told it because when i started it i was also treated like ha ha tk hobby hair um you know yes this is she does this on the side. Oh, Seema, you're going to tell us a little story today. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. when I entered into the space of talking about uh, pleasure, I was shunned. I, there was a lot of, I lost friends. I got labeled a prostitute amongst circles of friends. Um, I, yeah, it was horrible. I mean, and let me tell you, that hasn't changed. They won't now label me a prostitute because okay, you know, she's gotten better known, her voice has become slightly louder, so we can't say that to her. But they still behave really badly. I went to a party not so long ago. People of my age, people who've known me for the last, I don't know, 30 years, we've all been friends. The men still behaved so badly. You know, one guy even went to my hostess and said, oh, you've become friends with Seema recently. Do you know what she talks about? We still are talking about cutting somebody down. Yeah. So I just want to say that nobody, you know, I think Pandit Nehru said this. He said that if women want their rights, they're going to have to fight for them. Nobody, no oppressor through history has ever said, here are your rights on a silver platter. Go be fabulous, be amazing. You want something, you have to fight for it. I just feel that if you want your voice to be heard, you have to just keep speaking. You have to keep telling that story. And it's not easy, okay? Every woman who's ever tried to interrupt a guy or interrupt a boardroom or interrupt somebody else who's got a louder, more firm, more authoritative tone will know that it is not simple to do. Uh, how do you make your space literally by just hanging on in there? If it means enough to you, you will say it. Even if you get two people listening to you, say it. Don't mm -hmm. let anybody take away your voice. Um, I think it's the um, it's the first amendment in the American Constitution, isn't it? Uh, the right to free speech. To me, that means it's the right to tell your story. Yeah. That's that's so interesting. And I'm so sorry you had to go. You still have to go through all those comments, all those re remarks. It's just a very sad state of affair that we are living in. The only good thing about that is, uh, Ragni, that now I've got used to it. So now I carry it as a trophy. If somebody says that me at the age of 60, um, almost 61 this year, is the corporate call. That's what I was called when I was 50. I mean, either the corporates are doing really badly and they can't afford younger people, or I am that fabulous that they need me. Either way, the point is that if you actually stand up and you gather a space for yourself, everybody out there, is going to try and tear you down because that's just the way of the world. Um, you want your space, you have to take it. Yeah, yours to reclaiming those spaces. Yeah, uh, uh, Meghna, you, uh, I would, I would like to talk to you about this uh, one thing that I was recently uh, told that women continue to self-impose a glass ceiling. They tend to. Uh, 
समटाइम्स टेन टू पुश देम सेल्स बैक सेम की यू नो बिकॉज वी आर कंडीशन लाइक दिस की हमें ये नहीं करना चाहिए अरे ये तो लड़की है ये ऐसे क्यों कर रही है सो दी बिफोर एनी वन एल्स पुट्स दिस ग्लास सीलिंग विमेन सेल्फ इम्पोज इट एंड जस्ट स्टॉप्स बैक गोज बैक do uh, do you think we do do you resonate with that do you think that we need to not put a glass ceiling not even bother to have that conversation you know i think in 16000 years of patriarchy uh, women have constantly been held in this state of perfection and we may scream of equal rights and we may say okay we've made so much progress but look around you and understand the society that women that we've created today this notion of the superwoman and see how strongly rooted and deeply rooted in patriarchy this still is because now what society expects is that okay you want to go out there and work you want to go out there and own your spaces uh you want to go exercise your agency what we'll do unto you then is to hold you on to this impo- these impossible standards of perfection so now these women are then told that you have to be a superwoman who i think is the the villain of the feminists because now you're supposed to look like deepika padukone you're supposed to earn like indra noi you're supposed to be as nurturing as uh, nirupa roy uh, and you're supposed to be everything to everybody all at once and the this task multitasking and i see that uh, you know i'm expected to work like i don't have children i'm expected to raise my children like i don't work everything is a battle of just being able to exist to be able to do what you want to do so it's an endless battle and i always say that the way to fight this is first of all be terribly happy the the best way to battle patriarchy is to be in you know they call me the smiling author sometimes and i love it because uh i say that is my happiness that i've earned rightfully and through a lot of uh, tragedy actually and i always say that you know tragedy is the entry point for beauty if you want it to be that way you can be a lotus in spite of the swarm but the one thing i always tell women is dismiss this notion of perfection you know even the moon does not have to be whole in order to shine i'll repeat that the moon does not have to be whole in order to shine so you too don't have to be perfect in order to be your most incredible best self embrace your faults embrace your failings embrace your mistakes own it even publicly we uh, you know we we once we dismantle this notion of the superwoman once we say you know what like i had a, for example a divorce party in 2013 when it was unheard of and i had it in my little one bedroom in in bombay and people were shocked everybody showed up because they were very curious about what a divorce party looks like back then but they're like why would you know you can you can murder someone you can rape someone and get away with it but divorce is such a public failure that there everyone's going to find out uh, and scandal always travels faster than uh, you know accolades uh, so i think I embrace that very public failing by just enjoying it and I said I'm not I've never told anyone I'm perfect I I make mistakes every single day and uh I hopefully the only thing I can do from it is to gain some wisdom to gain some perspective and uh to bloom wherever I'm planted and I think that's for me has been uh the best way of battling patriarchy of battling being put into stereotypes that I'm a fundal- fundamentally flawed human being as are you as is everybody on the panel as it's everyone around the world and that's what our the center of our human experience is the centerpiece of our human experience is supposed to be we're not sent down here to have perfect lives and to look perfect all the time mm-hmm. and to make perfect decisions and have a perfect everything we're here to fall we're here to fail we're here to grow we're here to embrace ourselves at our imperfect perfection so enjoy that part of you and uh, don't let anybody else dismiss you for uh anything that you do just enjoy the journey however flawed however chaotic and messy it may seem yeah so uh, that was wonderful to hear uh this is my last question again i would like to come back to everyone with this uh what is that one piece of advice you would like to give uh, young girls today which you uh, you know which you believe you should have gotten to so uh start with yasmin i think believe in your elders uh that's one thing because they have they have walked that roads and they have a little bit of experience at least and um, i think experience 
these days is not taken as a good word because nobody wants to know your what your experiences are but everything that you gather is only through your experiences these days i see that um a lot of youngsters are not um they they feel they know it all so i think a little bit they can go softer on that and think for yourself and then you can take a choice make a choice of it okay uh, uh seema okay so um harking back to what megna just said i think that's what my advice to people would be to young people would be young girls in particular don't ever accept a pedestal you know our biggest downfall has been where the the way to stop us has been is to raise us to this goddess level you know you are perfect and when you strive to be perfect um uh, that's where you fall apart so i i think you know it's just one of those things for the longest time people would say you know guys would say to a girl oh you're not like other girls we have been trying to break this down and say don't take that as a compliment it's not a compliment you want to be like other girls the idea that you're not like other girls is not a good thing that just means that you fit in with their idea better with somebody else's idea better so never accept a pedestal it is a very tempting thing to do if somebody says you are so amazing you know when megna was speaking i was thinking about this actually that every time you turn somebody into a saint they become impotent in what they are able to teach you because you can't follow a saint so that's what patriarchy has done for us they've said become a goddess and then you're impossible to emulate be who you want to be just never ever accept a pedestal and say that yes somebody will worship me for doing this be who you are with all your faults and just be fabulous be fabulous uh meekna i think the one thing i've learned is you know uh that people will love you the way not they think you deserve but the way you think you deserve so the love that you get in your life and by the way love doesn't have to be romantic love again it's a, it's a social construct and i think we need to stop talking of love as just you know uh in terms of romance or in terms of you know ddlj or whatever influences us uh, as much as we may enjoy that I think love uh, can be a love for a pet it can be a love for your career it can be a love for uh, your adopted child it can be a love for just yourself and I think the one thing women are not told often enough is how to fall in love with themselves um and that's the thing that I want to tell everybody here who's listening that show up for yourself every day stand up for yourself every day and tell yourself every single day I love you because that's what you deserve and trust me once you learn to love yourself and embrace yourself with all your warts and wobbles and all of that your entire world view your entire universe will change for the better and you'll need no one once you need no one else in life to make you happy you will be so happy you'll wonder why you never did that before yeah thank you thank you so much everyone we have had so many affirmations today be fabulous love yourself believe in your elders and so many good things to hear thank you for this wonderful session and uh, i'm really glad we had this conversation and uh, all the best i think yeah thank you thank you thanks for having us ragini thank you seema thank you thank you my everyone is so thank delightful you. to meet all of you <laughs> the most amazing women same here you, you. <laughs>